Hello, everyone. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Dr. Clement Chimesi. I am a medical statistician at the Norfolk Department of Medicine at the University of Oxford. Um, over the past um, weeks and months, we started a lecture series on how to use GPower software um, in order to help determine the appropriate sample size that is needed for us to be able to empower our respective studies, be it clinical trials or be it ad observational studies that one wants to embark on. And in view of that, there, there are already videos on power analysis for the case of comparing between two independent groups. And also, we've also um, done a whole video on giving the whole motivation, the whole statistical um, motivation for why we have to always determine the optimal sample size and um, such that we don't use so large and so uh, too small sample size and what are some of the consequences. So we've given more of the statistical intuition behind this and, the, and all those videos would also be um, attached in the YouTube description of this particular video. So if you've not watched these videos, I would entreat you to kindly watch them before you actually proceed with this one, in, including how to install the GPAL software and so on and so forth. So um, without wasting much time, so this particular uh, video is just going to focus on power analysis for the case of comparing between three or more dependent groups. So this is to say that irrespective of the study you're embarking on, um, if you want to do a study where your primary goal is to compare some outcome, the outcome could be anything of interest. It could be comparing uh, concentration levels, immune response, it could be con comparing um, vaccine outcomes and so on and so forth across three or more independent groups. And then in the case of when they are dependent, we would have a whole video on how to approach these things. So for this particular video, we are just particularly going to focus on ANOVA type studies, like studies where the primary outcome is going to be more of an ANOVA kind of analysis. That is to say, we are focusing on situations where the comparable groups are three or more independent groups. So without wasting my time, I will share my screen uh, so basically, um, this is how the GPAL software um, looks like if you've already watched our YouTube videos. And um, so since we are just going to focus on power analysis for the case of um, where the primary analysis is going to be an ANOVA analysis. So the first thing we need to do is always to determine the appropriate test. OK, so I'm not going to go into t-test because we are not going to compare between either two dependent or independent groups. So now we'll go into F-test. And then when you go into F-test, we realize that there are so many statistical analysis uh, to be, uh, that needs to be selected here. And if you watch the video on where we gave the whole background or the whole intuition about, um, first of all, G-Power, how to use G-Power software, and also the intuition about the power analysis, we said that the, the choice of the power analysis is going to be dependent on your primary statistical analysis. So it means that what will be the main statistical analysis that you use to compare or detect difference between your, compar group, uh, your comparable groups if they do exist. So now, so it means that um, there will be subsequent videos that will feature each of these statistical tests in a separate video um, in, in, in the process of uh, performing power analysis. And so it means that for this particular uh, video, we are just focusing on the case of um, ANOVA, fixed effect, um, one way ANOVA. So where the, we have only one group you are comparing between, just that the group is made up of um, um, categories that are three or more independent categories, basically. So. It means that anytime you want to do a one-way ANOVA um, power analysis, you always have to choose this option. And after choosing this option, um, remember we said when you click here, there are basically about five things. There are instances where you want to estimate the sample size, given that you already know your alpha level, you know the power and the effect size. And remember the effect size is always computed based on um, a preliminary data or based on literature, if you already have data from literature and you don't have any experimental data at hand. And uh, or you could also use some of these conventional um, effect sizes um, that exist, such that either you are assuming small, moderate, or large effect. 
And then the other instances where maybe one is interested in computing the implied alpha and power given these other um, uh, parameters. And there are instances where um, individuals are interested in given that you already know your sample size, the effect size, and the alpha, this is often more like a sensitivity analysis or a post hoc analysis that one could do. And you want to be sure what was the achieved power given the sample uh, size that you used and the, the, um, the resulting effect size. And also, there are instances where the goal is to also estimate the effect size given your power, your sample size, and alpha. And this particular video will focus on um, um, estimating the required sample size. But I think the most important of these are estimating the required sample size and the, the postdoc analysis, which aims to estimate the achieved power, because these are two aspects of power analysis that are often of interest. We often go for the, this option that is computing the achieved power. If you have a fair idea about the sample size you want to use due to financial constraint, and you want to be sure, given that fixed sample size, what would have been the achieved power? So it makes it quite useful most of the times. And there are instances where you've already um, collected, a st you've already done a study, or you collected some observed data, uh, maybe from observational studies and so on, and you want to be sure about the power associated with the data that you have, given the kind of status analysis you'll be performing. So it, it makes it quite useful. And there are also instances where you don't have much of constraint. The only information you have is you have d data from past years or data, of experimental data or um, like preliminary data. Um, and of course, you will assume your power, your alpha level, and then you want to be able to estimate the minimum sample size or the optimal sample size um, required to detect a certain amount of power and uh, giving this effect size and your alpha level. Yeah, so that makes it quite useful. Um, so remember, please, if you've not watched the previous uh, videos in the case for independent t-test and the introductory sections um, and the overall scope of this particular lecture series um, that is focusing on power analysis for different kind of statistical designs, please, I will entreat you to click on the YouTube description to watch those previous videos. So without wasting time, we'll go straight into power analysis for ANOVA type um, studies. All right, so here, um, the most important thing is there's this uh, particular tab called the determine function. So if you click here, so it means that the among all these uh, um, parameters that we need to predefine, okay, so the alpha level is one thing that you have to propose or suppose okay so if you are if you are considering a two-sided test okay a two-sided or a two-tailed test is the case where you are trying to check whether there's difference between your comparable groups or not okay so if that's the case then you are going to use a two-sided um, um ANOVA um, test okay sorry and then in terms of the power we often assume at least 80 percent power but remember if it's a two-sided test and your um, original alpha level was 5%, you have to divide that 5% by 2 so that it becomes 2.5, and that will indicate that you are considering a two-sided or a two-tailed test, okay? If you maintain the alpha level at 0 0.05 without dividing by 2, then it means you are actually assuming a, um, um, a one-sided ANOVA test, okay? So that is one thing you have to be very careful about. So often we go for a two-sided um, ANOVA test, um, yeah, and since that's the case, you you divide the alpha by two. But depending on your study, if you are more interested in a one-sided um, ANOVA analysis, you don't divide the alpha by two. And for the power, we assume at least 80% power. And how many comparable groups are in your study? So it means that you are considering situations where you are comparing a certain primary outcome. You want to check whether there is any effect or difference um, between maybe five or more groups or maybe three or more groups. So let's suppose that number of comparable groups are six. So in that case, you set the number to six. So at the moment, the effect size is the only thing I've not um, I mean, predefined here. But remember, if I put the scalar here, have any such information about the effect size, we have this um, convention. So it means that, as you can clearly see, um, if you specify f to be at in the neighborhood of 0.1, that is 0.1, so it, that is considered as a small effect. 
if you set it in with uh, around 0.25 or in the neighborhood of 0.25 it's more like a moderate or medium effect you are interested in and for a large effect um, um that is um around in the neighborhood of 0.4 then you are considering a large effect if i say in the neighborhood 0.4 it means you could actually have an effect size which is let's say 0.8 and remember for anova the effect size is actually called the cohen's f if we're doing an independent t test, the effect size was called a Cohen's D. So there is there is that there, there are differences in notation. So be careful about these. So in the case of um, an independent two um, an independent um, t test, the convention for the effect size D would have been um, in the neighborhood of um, point um, point two is small. 0.5 is moderate and 0.8 in the neighborhood of 0.8 would have been large, but I think half of that, almost half of that is the case of the ANOVA, so don't forget. All right, so it means that if you don't have any preliminary data and um, to inform your effect size, then you can use some of these convention. So in that case, you could assume or estimate the sample sizes when you have, when you are considering small effect, when you are considering medium effect, and when you are considering large effect, and see how um, your sample sizes will fare or will be, um, and depending on that. So that is to say that if you are not too sure of what the effect size is, then you need to use some of these convention. However, it is the only parameter that needs to be calculated given a past historic data or given um, some existing um, preliminary or experimental data. All right, so now the next thing is to learn how to estimate the effect size F. Now, remember, there are instances where, um, um, so I'll come back to the G-Power software. So there are instances where you want to determine the effect size for ANOVA-based studies. However, you are not, the information you have does not fit the um, the, um, the existing um, way of computing the effect size in G-Power. So if I should uh, the, um, click on the Determine tab, it gives us an, an option on how to calculate the effect size. So here, remember, we were interested in at least, um, we were comparing between some, the primary outcome between six independent groups. So here we set the number of groups to be six. So here, the standard deviation is more like the pool standard deviation. So for instance, if you already know the standard deviations for these six um, groups, their respective standard deviations based on a preliminary data or maybe based on literature, you could actually find the pooled standard deviation and that would be what you, you define here. And then if you already know the respective means of each of the, the respective means in terms of the outcome and um, based on preliminary data or past data or literature, if you already know the means and what was their respective um, um, sample sizes. So for instance, let's say in a certain past historic data, um, the mean for the first group, okay, or maybe before you did your actual study, you, you first of all did a small study just to check the outcome and to see if the study was feasible to actually perform on a larger population. So in that case, you decided to first of all consider some small, um, and you did a small experiment, um, um, a, a small study, or it could be that there was already a, a previous study that had already been done. Okay, so in that case, let's assume maybe in the previous study, um, maybe for the first group, the mean was let's say 0 0.5, and uh, for the other, and remember, let's assume that in computing the mean, the sample size for that group was let's say 10, and then maybe the other one, so here I'll just put um, and um, arbitrary value. So let's assume here was maybe 12. In that case, we are not, we assume in the previous study did not assume equal sample, but I'm, I'm just um, um, hypothesizing, or we can just fix every all the sample size to be to be the same. So let's say the previous study is considered 10 sample size. So overall considered 60s and, 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 and total samples. Um, and the samples could be individuals, could be ma it could be ma mice, it could be any 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 target population of interest. Yeah. So let's say this is 0 0.9. Um, there's the mean. Let's say this is 1.5. Let's say this is um, 2.3. And let's say this is um, 2.5. Okay. So um, let me change these sample sizes to. 10 respectively. So I'm assuming that it was an equal sample size experiment. Okay. 
So basically, that is one way of computing the the um, computing the the effect size from G power. And so here, if you knew their respective standard deviation, then I'll show you a formula uh, for calculating the pool standard deviation, and that will represent the standard deviation for each of the groups. Okay, so and is often more like a weighted average that we, we used, which I'll show you. So let's suppose the, the, the pool standard deviation was, um, let's say, 2.5 or 2.8. Then you click on calculate. So when you click on calculate, that is the estimated effect size. If you okay, so basically, um, this is one way of um, computing the effect size. And if you remember, um, as we said, given the convention for a small effect, um, if you have an effect size of in the neighborhood of 0.1, it's considered small enough for the case of ANOVA-based um, analysis, and around in the, uh, in the neighborhood of 0.25 that is medium or moderate and 0.4 is large it is almost half of that of the independent t test basically um not like almost it's exactly half of the independent t test so you remember for the independent t test the effect size is called coins d and half of the the the, the conventional values is actually the, in the, the interpretation for the case of the ANOVA so that is one thing you should note so here as we touched on the in the previous um, videos, if you've not watched, we realized that the smaller the effect, the larger the sample size. So at the moment, you can actually click on calculate and transfer to main windows, and it will transfer our estimated effect size into the uh, uh, into this particular um, window. But um, remember, the smaller the effect size, the larger the sample size will be. And the larger the effect size, the smaller the sample size will be. So always the effect size and then the sample size are inversely related. So now we can now we can now click on calculate. And if you click on calculate, you realize that the total sample size is 200 and what? 200 and 200 and um and 228. Okay. So that is the minimum sample size that is required to um um achieve a power of at least 80 percent um giving an effect size of um, um 0.26 basically and remember of course as i said you can always um um check the effect of the sample size on the on the the effect of the effect size on the sample size if you click on xy um this particular um, um, window, it will open a destino pop up, and you, if you want to check the effect of so as we vary the sample size, so as we vary the effect size, how does it affect the total sample size? If you want to check whether um, if effect size are small, what will be its effect on the total sample size, and vice versa. So here we can maybe look into up to maybe um, let's say. Um, we, we, let's let's assume you are starting from 0.1 and maybe we want to end at 0.8 and maybe we want to increase uh, maybe the step size, let's say 0 0.02. And yeah, we are keeping everything constant. Um, it's still a two-sided test. That's why we've divided by 5% upper level by two. And now if you click draw, so this tells you the inverse relationship between the effect size and then the total sample size. So it means that the smaller at 0.1, um, you could see how large the, the sample size would be in total. And when we have a very a very large uh, effect size, we see how small the sample size become. Yeah. So that's basically the relationship between the uh, effect size and the total sample size, which we've already established in the previous videos. But it's not always that the preliminary information that you have or the information you have from the, from the literature or of course once you have a preliminary data you can always compute the mean the means and you can all compute the respective standard deviations for your comparable groups and and then of, of course find the pooled standard deviation um, and, and 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 use this uh, the gpower software to calculate this but there's also another alternative so i'm going to take us through that and also how to compute the pool standard deviation okay so from here there are two ways of calculating the effect size for 
um, ANOVA-based um, power analysis. So the first, the second type is what I just mentioned, in, I mean, which is basically what G-Power uses, where you have your respective means, and then you, based on the respective means, it calculates the, the Cohen's edge. So this is basically the formula. So it means, suppose we have um, here, we are considering about K groups, and then so it looks at these differences, the square of these differences, and divide by the pool standard deviation and take the square root of that. So you don't have to worry about this formula if you are using a G-Power software. And in terms of calculating the pooled um, standard deviation, um, so basically this is how you calculate the pooled variance. So which is the standard way you would have calculated the, I mean, the pooled variance if we're doing ANOVA analysis. So if there's sample size for the first group, if you are assuming equal sample size, then it means that um, N1 will be the same thing as NK, so you can actually factor that out, basically. So yeah, but so this is just the general case. It, um, if, even if your sample sizes will be different, or you're not using equal allocation ratios. So this is basically how you calculate the post uh, standard um, deviation. So you you actually consider the sample size of the first group minus one times its um, and variance and plus for the others in that fashion and divide by the total sample size minus how many comparable groups. So the K here represent comparable groups. In the special example that we're using in the GPAS software, K would have been six and so on, yeah. So this is if you had a preliminary data, okay? So you can easily compute this. Okay, so this is basically what you need to compute before you come to GPower and specify that sample size, that's uh, post standard deviation here. Remember, this would be the variance. So you have to take square root of this, of the resulting answer, in order to get the standard deviation. So this is basically more like um, how you would ordinarily um, compute the uh, effect size, uh, that's the coins F for the case of ANOVA in GPower. You don't need to calculate the F yourself. All you need to do in GPower is to specify the respective means of um, the comparable groups and what was their sample sizes that was used in getting that mean. It doesn't, the, the sample sizes don't have to be the same. Um, um, so it means if the previous studies um, considered equal sample size, then you specify those equal sample sizes that you use to achieve those means. And yeah, so don't, don't forget that. Um, so that's basically what, what you need to do. Um, yeah, but there are instances, another alternative is actually to calculate the coins F based on something called the eta square. So the eta square is more synonymous to what one would have called like the coefficient of determination or the R square. It's, it's quite synonymous to it. So basically the eta square is the ratio of your treatment sum of squares over the total sum of squares, okay? So that's the eta square or the partial eta square statistic. So in that, if you're using that approach, um, if this is what you want to use, then that's going to be the formula. So once you obtain your eta square, square root of the ratio of the eta square and one minus that becomes more of the estimate of your coins F. So I'll just go down quickly and demonstrate how um, you calculate um, or you determine the eta square if we're actually doing the analysis in R. So if you come down here, so this is like um, a toy example, so I just created this, this data. So suppose I have a dependent variable, which is protein responses, and that was comp and then my comparable groups are cell types, and the cell type, we have the naive, the diseased, and healthy cells. And now, so here we are assuming three groups. So here we assume that they were just three groups. Okay, of course, you could always extend it to uh, many, many. Yeah, so what you do is that if you want to be able to calculate the eta square um, in R, so the first thing is you fit or you fit your um, ANOVA uh, or you perform your ANOVA analysis in R, you can do it using a, general, a generalized linear model or a, a linear model function. So this is an inbuilt function. You don't need a package for that. So that's the dependent variable, which is the protein responses. And I'm comparing that across um, the cell types, OK? And in that case, you, you use the summary function. You, you get your summary. At this stage, I'm not really interested in these if these estimates. Um, yeah, so I will not even interpret this um, outcome. What we are interested in is how you'll be able to determine or extract your eta square 
after performing your ANOVA in R. Um, in, in, in this case, you can actually do the same with respect of the software you use. If you use um, Stata, if you use, um, if you use, how do you call it, SPSS, um, if you even use PRISM, we will demonstrate how you would actually calculate the effect size if you wanted to use the formula based on the eta square. And so, yeah, so now the most important thing is after fitting your um, your model, that is for the case of an ANOVA, and remember if we're using other um, as, as a synthetic software, you wouldn't have to perform this. It, 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 you would get the, the summary in a different form. But the most important thing is that in R, there's this function called the summary dot um, AOV. So it's basically summarizing your, your, your study in a typical ANOVA format that other softwares would summarize their ANOVA outputs as such. So in that case, so what we are interested in, in is, um, so here we have the residual sum of squares, the cell type. So remember the sum of squares here, this one corresponds to the treatment sum of squares. Okay, so there's the sum of squares associated with the comparable groups. Okay, so what we do is that the ratio, so basically the eta square is actually, as we saw from here, is the ratio of the treatment sum of squares divided by the total sum of squares. So the treatment sum of squares is more like the variability that was explained by the treatment of the comparable groups. And then the total sum of squares is actually when you when you consider both the explained and the unexplained variations. Okay, so that's the total sum of squares. So here, the ratio of, so this divided by the sum of this and that, okay, would give you that ratio. And so you can actually calculate it manually. If I was actually doing it manually, um, so this is basically the treatment sum of squares um, associated with the cell type. And then this is, uh, that's the explained variation and this is the unexplained as, um, associated with the residual sum of squares. So this ratio gives the eta square of um, 0 0.184. And then in R, there's also another, there's a package. Uh, so what I just did was a manual calculation. There's a, uh, there's a particular package called effect size package. And you can actually, once you fit your ANOVA model, remember ANOVA can be approached as a linear model. So remember, um, ANOVA is actually a regression, okay, where your um, dependent variable is the main outcome of interest and your comparable groups becomes your predictor. So remember, ANOVA can be translated into a regression and that's basically what R does. Um, so there's this package called the effect size package and you could actually also use that. So there's this function called the eta, under, eta underscore squared. And once um, you specify your model, the fitted model, um, it will also calculate the um, um, eta square for you. So eta square can actually be calculated manually or using a package. If we're using Stata and um, other softwares like GraphPad, Prism, and SPSS, and so on, remember what you are just interested in is the um, the treatment sum of squares, which is the sum of squares um, associated with the treatment of comparable groups and then um, the total sum of squares, basically that ratio is your eta square, okay? So once you get that, you can now use this formula to calculate the effect size. Um, that is basically, so once you get your eta, don't forget, once you get the eta square, that is not, the eta square is not your effect size, but it's rather the, that estimate divided by one minus that estimate, the square root of that becomes your effect size. So basically that is how you would have done it um, or um, determine the effect size um, um, based on the eta square. Suppose that was the information obtained from literature. Maybe in the literature they reported on the eta square. They didn't give specifics on um, the, 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 the they they didn't give specifics on the means and stand, the respective standard deviations. So if that information was not given to you in the literature, and uh, maybe uh, some studies had already some, some other researchers had already done a similar study, and they didn't give detailed information about their the respective means and standard deviations of the comparable groups, and the eta square information was given. Then you can have used this formula to estimate your effect size. So it's very important. Okay, so you can also um, estimate the the 
effect size basically from the variance only but there is a batch i mean direct approach which we've already touched on that is computing it from the partial um, eta square so it means that from the literature you've already know the partial eta square or you've already calculated it based on a preliminary data then it means that once you specify the partial eta square you remember the formula the formula a square root of um, the partial eta square divided by one minus the partial eta square. So it means that once maybe let's say the partial eta square was let's say zero point let's say um, eight seven. Once you click calculate, it also automatically calculates your effect size for you. And you can always click on transfer to transfer your estimated values here. So just remember. So if it's let's say point two was the partial eta square then you click calculate and it calculates your effect size for you so remember you can always um, um, calculate the effect size either based on knowledge of the means and their respective standard deviations or based on the partial eta square after performing an ANOVA analysis. And if you don't have a preliminary data, but these information are reported, the partial eta squares are reported in the literature, you can easily make use of that. Uh, maybe it could be a study that is, not, uh, that is almost related to your study, but the number of comparable groups are even different from your study. Of course, in such a case, you can even still hypothesized or make that uh, presumption and use their, pro their proposed it or estimated eta square for your study. Um, yeah, in that case, it's just used as an estimate rather than more like a, um, like an exact as estimate. Yeah, so remember, this is always um, achievable with G-Power software, but the only key part is that you can't calculate the eta square um, um, automatically from G power. So you need to determine it and I, and it's quite straightforward. It's just the ratio of your treatment sum of squares and the total sum of squares, which I've already explained. And you can actually do that in R or you can do that with other statistical softwares and just identify the treatment sum of squares. Um, and then the treatment sum of squares are often the sum of squares explained um, due to the comparable groups. And so those sum of squares, you divide by the total, which combines both the residual and the treatment sum of squares. And that ratio will give you your partial eta square. All right. Okay, so it's quite straightforward. So once you know your effect size, so remember the effect size is the only parameter that we estimate based on the data. And once you know the effect size, um, then the goal is now to click calculate and you're good to go. So remember, when the effect size was 0.26, the total sample size was 228. So suppose now I increase the effect size, for instance, to a moderate effect. Remember, in the case of um, ANOVA, a moderate effect is around um, is half of that of the coins D. The coins D for independent t-test, the moderate would have been, the convention would have been 0 0.5. So half of that would have been 2.25. So basically, um, 0.26 is actually a moderate effect. Sorry, I, I, I made that mistake. Um, if it had been, so it means if we decrease this to, let's say, 0.1, the total sample size is even going to increase even further. Initially, when it was 0.26, you realize that it was around 230 something. So now if you decrease this to um, 0.1, and calculate is going to be over a thousand, right? And um, that's because we demonstrated that the smaller the effect size, the larger the total sample size. And once we increase the the effect size to let's say 0.4, the the total the total sample size decreases. If we should even increase it further to let's say 0.8, it also decreases further. So it means that if we are if we are doing a small sample size experimental studies, especially those who uh, due to ethical concerns and maybe um, um, financial constraint, um, sometimes we want to control the sample size we really want to use rather than letting the software predict for us. If that's the case, it means that the sample size you want to predefine, it is always imperative to know what will be its corresponding achieved power. And that is where this option on the postdoc or sensitivity analysis where you calculate the achieved power given that predefined sample size and the effect size you've already estimated, 
based on literature or based on the preliminary data and your alpha level, then you, are, you calculate the achieved power for that. Um, yeah, so, um, so basically that this is basically all we need to know if you want to actually um, power study for the case of independent and um, more than two independent group studies. Yeah, so so um, without wasting oh, and of course, you can always do other explorations and look at how maybe suppose we want to know the effect of power on the choice of on the total sample size. So, for instance, you want to know because we predefine power at 80%. You want to know, OK, suppose you were to increase the power to, let's say, 95 percent. OK, maybe let's increase the step size here by 0.5. So it means once I start with 0.6, the next one will be um, 0 0.65, 0 0.7, 0 0.75 and so on. Yeah. So here, if I should click on draw. So this is uh, telling us that once we increase power, the total sample size will automatically increase. So it means that there is a positive association or relationship between power and the total sample size. And there is an inverse relationship between the effect size and the total sample size. Yeah. So here too, we can actually consider um, different sample, different effect sizes. So here I realize that we've considered a large effect. So suppose I want to now have situations where maybe so i've said three here so three here means that i want to consider situations where i have let's say a small effect okay a very small effect and um and moderate and large okay so if, if i want to increase uh, maybe i'll increase this the step size should be so if i'm starting with point let's say one maybe the, i want the next one to be around um um maybe 0.25 so um let's say you let me increase the step size to um 2.25 so it means if i start with 0.1 the next one will be around 0.35 and the next one yeah so if i should and then i'm assuming a two tail test so that's why i've divided the alpha by two so if i if i should click draw here Okay, um, let me just choose a, a more appropriate option because this one seems, um, of course, I'm getting what I want, but let me let me just choose, let's say, for just a sperm, um, for just, yeah, let me choose point, let's say point one. Okay, so it means once I start with the effect size of point one, the next one will be point two, and the next one will be point three. So you realize that. The black one is a large, it's a small effect size. The orange or yellow is small, is the moderate in this case, and uh, 0.3 is the largest among these. So you realize that the larger the effect size, the estimated sample size is smaller irrespective of the power. Okay. Um, and, and, the, and the smaller the sample, the smaller the effect size, the total sample size would always be larger irrespective of um, at what value you power the study. OK, so that is one thing that we need to know. And remember, um, I demonstrated how you save this output in the previous videos. Of course, if you want to and um, you just right click this, you, you can click on. Sorry, save plot to file. And then maybe I want to save it on my desktop, maybe ANOVA, I, I want to call it. Anova, Anova output or graph, whichever, how, whatever, whichever you want to call it, I save it. So you can actually um, open it and you have this nice graph you can actually include in your proposal, you can include in your study, it could be a grant and so on and so forth. So um, don't forget, and you can always convert um, this um, PDF to PNG if you're interested in that. And for those who use latex for scientific writing, you can actually insert this graph directly um, and you can always convert it to. Um, um, and if you are using Fawcett Reader, you can always snapshot and this and copy this graph. Maybe suppose maybe you have a Word document. Let me see. Um, yeah, so you can always you can always paste the graph and so on and so forth. All right. So um, 
So that is basically all what we need to know as far as um, G, I mean, power analysis is concerning the case of ANOVA type uh, studies where you have you are comparing your primary outcome across um, three or more groups. And remember, um, so that is actually what this particular video focused on. And remember, there are instances where the, comp the primary outcome is not just one continuous outcome. There are instances where you have, let's say, about three or four or two um, dependent variables or primary outcomes that you really you want to compare across your comparable groups. OK, and in that case, instead of doing um, separate ANOVA power analysis for each of the dependent variable, which in, in that case is statistically impermissible in, because in that case you are actually going to lose power and 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 it's not the most appropriate way so in, when it happens that way then we now have to use a multivariate ANOVA to power our study so it means in our next video we are going to consider power analysis in the four um, independent um, groups where we have um, more than three um, independent groups however the the number of dependent variables or the comparable uh, uh, or the primary outcomes or endpoints are more than one. So, and when it happens that way, we are going to power our study based on something you call multivariate ANOVA, which is known as MANOVA. And there are instances where um, the comparable groups are just two. Okay, so two independent groups that in the case of independent t-test. However, the, the, the primary outcomes are more than are more than um, one. So it means, let's say, you are comparing concentration levels, you are comparing maybe immune responses, you are comparing um, other other metrics. It, it could be genetic samples and so on and so forth. And and maybe let's say you have six of them and you want to compare across two independent groups. In that case, we would have considered that we would consider a hotel in T-square, which is a multivariate independent T-test, if you think about it that way. Yeah, so of course, in such instance, you could still have used the manoeuvre to still estimate that, but more appropriately, the hotel in T-square will, will be considered for um, the case of the two groups. It's just like saying that if you have two groups, you can still use ANOVA to perform or estimate the difference between the two groups. However, it is not statistically appropriate, even though the results might all would converge with the independent test. It doesn't make it appropriate. Yeah. So always remember, use the right tool for the right job. So without wasting time, I will end here. And please, if you've not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please, I will entreat you to subscribe. And remember all the videos from the subsequent um, um, studies and subsequent um, how do you call it, subsequent lecture series that we've already done are uh, all in the YouTube description of this particular video. So I will entreat you to watch, study at your own pace, and I believe power analysis will become thing of the past. And um, without wasting my time, I will end here. Do have a wonderful day. See you soon and see you next time. Take care. Bye.